You find your way to the intersection of faith and the culture. Thanks for joining us on Wall Builders Live. Find out more at our website, wallbuilderslive.com. This is a place where we look at all the issues of the day from a biblical, historical, and constitutional perspective. My name is Rick Green. I'm a former Texas legislator and America's Constitution coach, and I'm here with David Barton. He's America's premier historian and our founder here at Wall Builders. Tim Barton's a national speaker and pastor and president of Wall Builders, and some guy has snuck his way into the studio. I don't know how this happened. We're going to get a a uh, little review with our security team, actually from our team here at Wall Builders, Jonathan Ritchie. Once in a while, we get him here on Wall Builders Live. Jonathan, thanks for joining us today, man. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, these guys drafted you in uh, for a really special topic. Uh, are you ready to be grilled by the Bartons? I, I've been training every day for it. <laughs> well, I tell you what, folks that uh, want to know more, go to wallbuilderslive.com. By the way, you can get previous programs. Now, you got to go back a few months, but Jonathan spent almost a week with us uh, on the program. I think it was January, wasn't it, Jonathan? Sounds right to me. I don't Something like that. It, it'll be an adventure. They can search, right? Anyway, that's all on the website there. And also, that's the place to make a contribution. So not only uh, for great programs like this, where we're going to answer a lot of the 1619 Project questions, uh, but also our guests uh, throughout the week, our Foundations of Freedom Thursday programs, Good News Friday, all of that happens because of your donations. So thanks to all of you out there that have come alongside us and made that one-time or monthly contribution. If you've been listening and enjoying the program, it's a great way to pay it forward. It's a great way to get this program in the hands of more people. So please consider doing that at wallbuilderslive.com today. All right, guys. So uh, a lot of a lot of great victories uh, across Texas and maybe across uh, other states. I haven't looked close in, in the school board elections, r- pushing back on this critical race theory that has been infiltrating our schools. So we've got some good news to celebrate. But, Jonathan, you've been really looking into this and how dangerous it is Uh, for the country. So we're going to talk about this throughout the day. Where do you guys want to start? Well, let's start with the election, Rick. You mentioned the election. I want to pull one out that actually made national news. And it came out of the Fort Worth, Dallas area in a little town. Well, I can't see a little town. It used to be a little town called South Lake. And South Lake is an area that... It used to be small enough, David, that they beat my hometown team in Wiley 55 to nothing on my senior homecoming. So I don't want any good news from South Lake. I'm still bitter all these years later. Well, I'm going to back up a little bit and say I have memories of South Lake back when they were a 1A school and I played <laughs> basketball for a 1A school. And 1A. I made, I made 10 out of 10 free throws in a game against South Lake. So they stick with me, man. <laughs> all right. All right. I've well, got well, good Jonathan, memories. we Jonathan, get it. We I, get it. Y'all are old. <laughs> 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 they went from 1A in David's day to 3A in my day to now they're like, I don't know, one of the largest schools in the state. Yeah, they're, they're big. <laughs> and so they're a very conservative town, and they just haven't been real involved in their town's politics. They've just kind of let it flow and go as it wants to. And over the last couple of elections, there's been some fairly unusual people that have kind of stepped in and started doing really things in the schools that they don't go along with. And, and part of it has been critical race theory. And so this is not a school where there's been a lot of racial tension or racial problems going on, but they introduced this critical race theory stuff. Yeah, and actually, let's let's also point out, one of the reports that came out recently, maybe over the last couple of weeks, was regarding South Lake School District, how in their end-of-year testing, one of the things that has been more unique is because they they do have a lot of diversity in the town, um, the white students and the black students or, or students of right whatever kind of minority ethnicity you want to throw in there. But generally, the white students and black students is how it was phrased in the report, tested the same with end of year testing. And that's very unusual on a lot of levels um, when you compare school districts that you don't always see the same level of performance, which is why oftentimes people have come in and said that maybe certain schools are racist or the testing isn't good and we need to reevaluate testing. South Lake has shown, wait a second, no, no, we treat every student the same, and every student has excelled because we've treated every student the same. But then, Dad, as you mentioned, there were people that came in and, and said, we need to change this whole system. Even though it's working, even though students are performing very well, we need to come in and change the whole system and introduce things like critical race theory, which we're going to now have oppressors and the oppressed, and and we're going to make victims and, and the victimizers and this whole culture. We're going to have to change everything we do even though what they were doing was making them one of the most successful schools in the nation with academic achievement and performance. So it didn't make any sense at all. And so what happened is parents said, no, 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 this is not the way we want to go. I mean, things have been real good, and you're trying to stir stuff up. 
And so the parents formed a group, and, and that group kind of represented a lot of the community of South Lake. I think I heard that 50 churches got involved. They were able to bring 50 churches to the table, say, this is not what we want our kids being raised with. We like what it's been, and our city council is, is pretty much kind of going crazy, and we don't like where things are headed. So they ran a slate of five candidates. They had mayor, I think, two city council, and two school board. And they, what they did is they let people know, hey, these are folks that, that have this conservative viewpoint, that don't want to stir stuff up. They want to fix stuff. They want good solutions. Like the results we're getting, we want to get good results. We don't want to go in this new radical kind of critical race theory stuff. And so in that election, local election, it turned out that there were three times more than previous elections. So people really showed up, and those five candidates represented the conservative viewpoint. They won by a 70 to 30 margin. I mean, just absolutely cleaned the clock of the other side. And so, of course, that made national news. And because they were going after critical race theory, CNN and others pop out and say, well, it was racism displayed in South Lake. There was all these racist voters. No, it wasn't. It was voters who didn't want to see racism get started by setting one group against another. And so it did make national news, right? But yeah, there were school board elections and there were a lot of good results across Texas. Not other, every state has school board elections at the same time. But in Texas, we can really see that in, in certain areas, parents really are pushing back against this kind of 1619 and critical race theory kind of philosophy that's starting to move forward. And guys, I hear my own hometown of, of Dripping Springs, we had three slots open, nine candidates. I interviewed the candidates, sent them surveys, asked them about critical race theory, you know, masks on kids, all that kind of stuff. I had five good candidates to choose from. I've never had that problem. I don't know about y'all. I had to narrow down from good candidates. I didn't have to pick, you know, the, the least bad. I had to narrow down from the good ones. That was a really nice problem to have. And the number one vote getter was was our top choice. Uh, so it's it's just it's I mean, that speaks volumes in terms of good news in the areas that we typically can't get anybody to pay attention. And now all of a sudden they're really paying attention to these very important areas. So really, really good stuff to hear. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll, we'll get deeper into this critical race theory thing. I think people are hearing that phrase uh, more and more. But we'll talk a little bit more about what it is, where it came from and how to combat it in your community. Stay with us, folks. You're listening to Wall Builders Live. This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. Although education has remained an emphasis in America for nearly 200 years, what has changed the most over that period of time is the philosophy of education. For example, while religion finds no place of refuge in our schools today, such was not the case at the time of our founding fathers. In fact, when the Delaware Indian chiefs brought their youth to be trained in America's schools, on June the 12th, 1779, George Washington told them, you do well to wish to learn our arts and our way of life and above all, the religion of Jesus Christ. These will make you a greater and happier people than you are. Congress will do everything they can to assist you in this wise intention. According to George Washington, what students learned above all in American education at the time of the Founding Fathers was the religion of Jesus Christ. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD. We're back on Wobblers Live. Thanks for staying with us. We got Jonathan Ritchie in studio with us. We're talking about uh, 1619 Project, critical race theory. Uh, Jonathan, people are hearing these terms more and more and more. So let's kind of break it down, what that means, where it came from, and how we defeat it. Sure. Well, critical race theory is kind of the the new academic trend where, like Tim was saying, it really does try to set you know people and groups against each other, right? White versus black, victim versus oppressor. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And, and for people who you know who maybe have studied Marxism and things, it's kind of this dialecticism of right progress has gotten through groups fighting against each other, and then whoever survives is going to be this you know greater synthesis. And so this is the idea, but really it goes back to the 1619 project, right? I mean, I, I'm sure we've talked about it a lot uh, on air and other places, but it's you know the 1619 project was done by the New York Times. As this historical initiative to replace, you know, the curriculum in the classrooms with this new vision of America, which says America started not in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence, the idea that all men are created equal, but rather America started in 1619 when the first African slaves 
according to them, even though that even that's wrong, but where they say the first African slaves are brought to American shores. And so it really tries to reframe the entire story of America, the entire identity of America, not behind the ideas of the Declaration, but behind the idea and the story of slavery. And so that's really kind of the legs underneath this critical race theory idea. But it's totally ahistorical and just – I mean it's really just bad history, wrong history, and it's not the truth. Well, it, you know, even what you said, Jonathan, they didn't even get the year right on their title, <laughs> you know? Yeah, they're almost 100 years wrong actually, which is fascinating, but – 100 years wrong in what sense? Let's unfold this for yeah, a second. Yeah, so basically the 1619 Project, their whole name comes from the idea that the first time black slaves were brought to America was in the year 1619. But that's actually not true. African slaves were brought to what is now the continental mainland United States uh, as early as 1526. By, by whom? By the Spanish. Okay. So the Spanish brought them and it actually – they uh, they they were an early expedition. The colony is now lost because it didn't last – very long. Uh, and then there was another colony in Florida, but the 1526 one was in the uh, somewhere along the lines of North and South Carolina. So this is mainland, you know, not actually not too far away from where Jamestown and they landed in 1619. And then the Spanish made another colony, again, bringing black slaves prior to 1619 in the uh, 1560s in Florida. So you have two Spanish colonies with the introduction of African slaves prior to 1619 that the the New York Times and their great historical wisdom just completely ignore because it doesn't fit their narrative. Yeah, and it's even if you want to go for when what we'd call chattel slavery got started in America, you got to go to 1653. It's not even 1619. So what's interesting is this is a curriculum, if you will, and by the way, this is now in use in all 50 states. So it's a free curriculum. A lot of teachers take it, use it, they teach it. So it is so historically flawed, but that's not their point anymore. They, they don't even care whether the history is right. It's all about narrative, and I think that's part of what they said when they introduced this, wasn't it? Yeah, the whole idea was to reframe and really transform history, and you can you can see that in their curriculum and in the, the kind of projects that they have kids do. Um, one of the things that they, they instruct children to do is instead of learning your own history, you're supposed to imagine a alternate timeline or imagine a new family genealogy, they say. So, right, don't don't worry about studying what actually happened. Just make it up yourself. Which I, I, one of the things that really shocked me, you showed me uh, what they called an erasure point, and they took an actual federal law. And this federal law, I'm, I'm going to say, all right, if you were doing typing on a sheet of paper, the federal law was about— Wait a two, second. Typing on a sheet oh, of paper? I'm what sorry. Is, you what does guys that don't mean? know what typing is. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> was this back in the 1A wow. days or the what? 3A days? Yeah, that... What is paper? Is that... <laughs> back to the 1A days. <laughs> Man, I, you know, and I was going to make the comment that when you type, there's 66 lines on a piece of paper, and so— you guys I'm really going to add to the age. I thought, I thought I you did said it was a blank piece of paper. How wow. are there 66 lines well, on I, it? I, I was going to tell you it took two-thirds of the paper, and that's about 44 lines, but that wouldn't mean anything to you either. No, I oh, lost Oh, me. man. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you guys, man, you need so to— So if I'm looking at my computer screen, how much of my screen would be filled and how much— I, that? Uh, I just it, want to go on the record saying I got an A in typing in high school. Okay, I just want good, to make sure that's good out job. Yeah. You had a yeah. class. <laughs> <laughs> Golly, I didn't think you were that old, Rick. <laughs> so, if this were a Word document, it would the law would take up about two thirds of one page, and and Jonathan showed this to me, and it was it was an actual federal law, and they took um, for the exercise for kids the the page they gave them, they took what we would just consider a, a black marker and just went through line after line after line, and they would leave a few words here and there. So let, let's say there were a thousand words in that law. They left maybe, what, 25 words in that law? Yeah, maybe. And that maybe might be 25. And, and they're telling the kids, this is what the law is. Now rewrite it the way you want it to be. And here's the way they actually describe it in the curriculum. They say erasure poems can be a way of reclaiming and reshaping historical documents. They can lay bare the real purpose or transform it into something totally new. Uh, but what's what's fascinating is in the actual magazine, they don't give you the option to even see what the real law is. Yeah, you don't even get to see what the law is that, that they wiped out with that marker. You don't even know what they changed. Yeah. They don't give you an opportunity to see what the truth actually is. Same thing with the alternate timeline type of thing. It's don't even 
worry about what actually happened. Just come up with something else. Well, and this is one of the things, too, that becomes then very important is one of the one of the reasons that we would encourage people that you need a steady history. is so you learn the lessons from history, because maybe right, maybe in these eraser points, they're saying, well, hey, this was a bad law and these things should have been in there. OK, like maybe we would agree that was a bad law and, and there were some bad things in there. But but how do you know if it's a bad law if you, you haven't actually read what the law is? Right. That This is part of where you learn from history. And, and we acknowledge there's the good, the bad and the ugly in history. But you can learn from all of it. And to now go back and say, well, we're, we're going to reimagine what history was or should have been. Well, you can't even really reimagine it if you don't know what it was in the first place. You have to learn the truth. And then if you want to reimagine it, that's something you can do. But but to not know the truth and then to make up your own timeline to, to make your own construct out of whatever this writing or this law, or this letter, whatever this historic document you're looking at might be, what, what we are saying is that we should disregard all of history. And this is why it allows people to buy into the narrative of things that are so historically inaccurate because they don't know what the truth is. And that's not really the point of what these projects are. It's, it's not to help kids learn the truth of history. It's to help them reshape and redirect things based on how they feel, what they want etc. But again, if, if you don't know historically what happened, then you don't know how to even solve the problems going forward. How can you point back and say, well, here's what, what we did wrong. Here's where it started. Here's where the fundamental change was. So here's how we fix it. How do you know how to fix problems if you can't even properly identify what the problem was? And this is the challenge when you remove so much history, which is what this 1619 project largely does. You know, the, it's also a manifestation of stuff we've talked about over recent three or four years where we've seen the polling saying that Two-thirds of Americans don't believe there's absolute truth. They make their own truth. They can create their own truth. And so now it doesn't matter what history is because that's not truth, even if it actually happened. I reject that because here's how I want it to be. Here's how I imagine it to be. Here's how – it's just – this is the whole thing of truth also. And, yeah, and this is not hyperbole as we're having this conversation because we've literally talked with college professors and, and showed them original historic documents where they said, well, I don't agree with that. And we're going, wait a second. Do you acknowledge this is an original document? Yes, it looks original. Okay, do you acknowledge this is what it says? Yes, it's what it says, but I don't I don't like it. I don't agree with it. And 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 this is where like literally college professors are rejecting something that should be a a granted like non-debatable true objectively true situation that yes, that's the original document. That's what it says, so that's that's what it means, right? That's what it says. It's right there in front of you. And we've literally had professors say, "Well, I just don't believe that." And and these are the people that are teaching the rising generation. We are teaching that it's more of how you feel, it's more of what you want, that truth is subjective, it's relativistic. There, there's so much that unfolds in this. But again, th- this is where the challenge is, even with things of the 1619 Project and these curriculums, is that we're not teaching kids what is true, and we're not encouraging them to learn lessons from historical accuracy. We're saying just make it be what you want it to be, and just how you feel, what you think, what you desire, that's all that really matters. You know, Jonathan... You showed me a letter that we had from someone that they sent in that really kind of drove this home for me because it was so impactful. Why don't you share what that, that listener sent to us? Yeah, so this listener, she wrote in. She'd actually talked to some of the folks on the phone and ordered some product because what she was doing is she decided to actually go back and investigate her family history. So, right, totally disregarding the 1619 appeal to not study history at all. She started to go back and investigate her own family history, and she's a— African-American woman and wanted to discover, you know, where did my family come from? And she did amazing work. She actually sent in a little booklet uh, that that breaks it down. I mean, it's awesome. I, I read through her story, her family story. She traced it back six generations. So really did just some impressive historical primary source research. So she comes from a family that today all of them are Democrats. But as she starts studying the past, lo and behold, she discovers, wait a second, Back in, you know, after emancipation, the the late 1800s, when the Republican Party was around, all of my ancestors were a part of the Republican Party. Why was it? So she just dives into it. You know, I think she picked up some of our resources about, you know, black history in America, learned a lot from there, has been sharing it. But she goes and she tells the story and and they uh, her ancestors helped start churches and things of that nature. You know, we're we're leaders in education in the community at the community level, just like the story that we kind of started out with. And so just a really fascinating story. But she she started sharing this information with all of her family and they were just shocked. They, you know, they they couldn't believe that. Wait a second. You know, we we used to be Republicans. um, And so it was a real kind of historical awakening. But it came from studying the truth. Right. Going back to the primary sources 
you know, doing that responsibility and, you know, and sometimes it's really tricky, but nowadays it's easier than ever with the internet and all the, the great tools that are available, but it was a really encouraging story, really cool to get to hear from her. And, you know, it's something that I'd encourage everybody, you know, if you don't know your family history, start digging into it. I mean, it is fascinating some of the things that that you can find and discover. And, you know, maybe you'll have a story similar to her. Maybe you'll have something totally different, but it's so cool to get to know the people uh, that, you know, you came from, from a certain point of view. Loving truth, seeking truth, uh, defending and speaking that truth. That's what Wobblers is all about. We'll be right back. Stay with us, folks. You're listening to Wobblers Live. Hey guys, we want to let you know about a new resource we have at Wall Builders called The American Story. For so many years, people have asked us to do a history book to help tell more of the story that's just not known or not told today. And we would say very providentially, in the midst of all of the new attacks coming out against America, whether it be from things like the 1619 Project that say America is evil and everything in America was built off slavery, which is certainly not true, or things like even the Black Lives Matter movement, the organization itself, not, not the statement Black Lives Matter, but the organization that says we're against everything that America was built on and this is part of the Marxist ideology. There's so many things attacking America. Well, is America worth defending? What is a true story of America? We actually have written and told that story. Starting with Christopher Columbus, going roughly through Abraham Lincoln, we tell the story of America not as the story of a perfect nation or a perfect people, but the story of how God used these imperfect people and did great things through this nation. It's a story you want to check out. Wallbuilders.com, The American Story. We're back here on Wobblers Live. Thanks for staying with us. Jonathan Ritchie in studio with us. And, and, and guys, as we enter our final segment here, um, you said it as we went to break, Jonathan. One of the things people can do is study their own history. Um, what else can we do with regard to our attitudes towards this real this friction in our culture right now over race? I think one of the things we can do is look back into history again because America is a very, very diverse people. We have a lot of people here with a lot of different backgrounds. But that's always been the case. You know, we talked a few programs ago how that even in the American Revolution, it was a real melting pot. People don't recognize that. But Washington had 76 generals and 28 of them came from foreign nations. I mean, we blacks served nine times longer on average in the American Revolution than whites did, integrated units, et cetera. So we were a melting pot. We just don't know that. If you look at subsequent generations, I'm struck by the speech that Teddy Roosevelt gave back in his day where he said, I don't want hyphenated Americans. I don't. That's bad for the country to have groups. And I think it's important that he said that because at the time he had the most diverse cabinet in American presidency. We actually have a letter from him where he goes through and talks about how diverse his cabinet is, how many different ethnicities he has, how many different groups, how many different backgrounds and immigrants and et cetera. And so here's a guy who is very much into bringing communities together and saying, we can't have hyphenated Americans. You can't have Scottish Americans and you can't have Italian Americans and French Americans. We're all Americans. It's a it's a set of beliefs and ideas. And I think the problem with the critical race theory in 1619 Project is they want to create different kinds of Americans and different groups. They want to break it up. And one of the things I think, too, we can be intellectually honest about is say that, look, there was times in our nation's history where, where maybe there was systemic racism. There were systems of racism because when slavery was legal, that was a system of, of racism. If you go back to some of the Jim Crow laws and before the, the civil rights, rights laws passed, there was systemic racism. It was part of the system. But by and large, we have seen that there were good people that, that stood up against some of those things and said, we need to change those. We need to do something different. And, and, and what we are seeing now is not offered solutions but instead, highlighting of problems with, with no solutions. Uh, my, my grandfather, who was an uh, engineer, helped design multiple planes that were part of the U.S. military. Actually, he was a design engineer on the F-16. He was a chief design engineer on the F-111. And one of the things, and then this is probably his thinking as an engineer, but one of the things he would always tell us uh, when we were kids, and, and you know maybe we were staying in his house, we'd have some kind of friction and kids were fighting and we'd come to him, we'd want him to solve the problems or we want to come tell him really about how somebody else had done something wrong, that the response he consistently gave was, don't come to me with a problem, come to me with a solution, right? Don't just come tell me what's wrong, tell me what do we do to solve it. And right now what we are seeing is that we are, we are watching schools propose to students all of the problems and the solution they're offering are things that's going to bring more devastation, more pain, more hurt, more division. 
And, and it brings me back to one of the things that MLK used to say is that hate can't drive out hate. Only love can do that. One of the things that as Christians we fundamentally know is you have to walk in forgiveness. You have to walk in love. But in the midst of this, we can be honest as as historians, as conservatives, be intellectually honest and say, no, there were definitely times in American history where America did some very bad things. With that being said, bad things don't have to define who you are today. And who we are today can be very different than what we were back then. And we need to be hearing messages of unity and coming together. And this is also why, guys, going back to where we started, even with Southlake, why it was so encouraging what happened in Southlake, because the parents recognize that people are trying to bring division with this critical race theory coming into these schools with the 1619 Project. And so you had churches, you had parents rally together and say, no, we, we, we are grateful that our school is already in a place where our white students, our black students are performing on par with each other. We are doing good things because we're treating all of them equal under God. And, and that's one thing that everybody can do. That's, Tim, as you mentioned, school board elections, you can look at your own school board. And if there's critical race theory or something going to try to divide, get involved in the elections. Maybe run yourself or recruit someone to run. Definitely go vote and vote for candidates who will bring unity, not division. And help educate people. Take this program today and share it with your friends and family. You can go to wobblerslive.com today and get the link. Also look in the archive section. Back in February, there's three days of programs where Tim Barton gives a fantastic presentation on the 1619 Project in response to it. More information there. It's all at the website. Check it out at wobblerslive.com. Thanks so much for listening to Wobblers Live. We stand undivided.